Hello everyone, thank you all for coming. My name is Nicholas Hamasevich, and I'm Director of Research and Academic Affairs here at the Korea Economic Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here to KEI for our academic paper series event today on Chinese perspectives on North Korea and reunification. We are excited to have columnist and correspondent Sunny Lee here to kick off our 2012 academic paper series. This is an important topic that Korea and Asia watchers are always trying to fig further understand the death of Kim Jong-il and the uncertainty around the new leadership of Kim Jong-un only raises the significance of what policies China will undertake toward North Korea and how it will approach unification of the Korean Peninsula. But part of the heightened importance of actions toward the Korean Peninsula right now is the uncertainty of what China will do with its neighbor and its policies for Korean unification. A couple of reports come to mind, including some by our speaker, about how for the Chinese leadership, often North Korea is one of the most difficult and divisive issues they have to deal with. Moreover, there was a great report last year by the Korea Real Time blog about a Korea Institute for National Unification event uh, where they had the ambassadors from the United States, Japan, and Russia talk about how their countries saw unification. The Chinese ambassador to South Korea was invited to the event as well, but did not attend. Fortunately, we have someone with us here today who is constantly working on these issues to give us his thoughts and talk us through some of the important factors of Chinese perspectives on North Korea and Korean unification. Sunny Lee is Chief China Correspondent with the Korea Times and is columnist with the Asia Times. Mr. Lee is also completing his PhD dissertation on North Korea at Tsinghua University in Beijing. He was born in Seoul and graduated from Grinnell College and Harvard University. He has been living in China now for 10 years, and for those of you who read his columns and reports know, he is constantly writing and reporting on issues involving China and Korea, so we are very glad he was able to write a report for our academic paper series and is here today to talk about that paper with us. Please join me in welcoming Sunny Lee. How oh, does it work? Is it open? Okay. Great, great. I got it. Yeah. Oops, oops. You shouldn't be good here. Oops. Yeah, that is a mistake. Um. Oh. Hi, I'm Sunny Lee. Uh, I should have used my laptop computer, but yeah. Um, I heard that this is a one and a half hour session, and the little bird told me that the people come here, the main reason is not for the substance of the talk, but because of the quality of the food. <laughs> so I feel so relieved that you know I can entertain you for the next one and a half hours. So at least, you know, at the end of this session, you know, you don't remember anything what I've talked, but at least you feel this feeling of, you know, you know, how should I say, your stomach being saturated with these uh, nutritional values. So I think that should be, you know, your time not wasted. Uh, and I, today I'm going to talk about the relationship between uh, um, China and North Korea and how China sees uh, North Korea and also Korean issues. And uh, I'm sleep deprived for the last 40 hours because of the, you know, airplane jet lag. Uh, and uh, I feel like I'm 50 years old boy. And as you know, probably in Asia, the age 50, you know, we call it in Korean language, it's Jichenmyeong age. Or in Chinese, it's, uh, you know, Tianming. Uh, it's the age that knows the heaven's mandate. So, whatever I'm going to say today, you take it as the mandate from the heaven. <laughs> 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 
That's it. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm well, you know, accepted. We have some agreement here. So let me talk about, although Nicholas told me something about me, but let me just briefly talk about myself because you must be <coughs> curious about who I am. I grew up in Seoul. I went to schools in the States and two schools in China. Actually, I'm completing my PhD in China, Beijing. Uh, I'm writing a dissertation about the relations between journalism and also North Korea. <laughs> Have been living in China for 10 years. Um, and that's why I think that's why KEI invited me, uh, wrongly believing that I know something about China. It's good those kind of misconceptions you know, prevail so they can invite me. Uh, also, I served two years my military service at the uh, U.S. Army as a Kutusa and Yongsan Garrison. Uh, actually, my, um, when I served in the military, the colonel at the Inspector General's office, he write a recommendation letters so I could study in, in the States. Um, so that's about me. And this is the outline. You know, these days, very interestingly, whenever we talk about North Korea, we also talk about China. It's very fashionable, it's very sexy to talk about China when you talk about North Korea. Why? Because China is important. China is a very important stakeholder. Then, when you want to work on a solution on North Korea, then we have to work with China as well, because China is important. China is a big, important stakeholder on North Korea. If we want to work with China, then we have to understand Chinese views, where China is coming from. So that's the outline of today's talk. And I'll talk about for 30 minutes, and I'll take many questions so we can interact with each other. And we can think about questions such as what could motivate China to exercise its much touted influence on North Korea, right? You know, six party talks, cooperation, contingency plans. <laughs> we need Chinese cooperation and many other. Denuclearization, we also need Chinese cooperation, right? So the goal of my paper was try to understand the Chinese early sentiment on key issues that shape Chinese attitude toward North Korea by surveying Chinese experts on North Korea. I think these survey results are something that you, know, you are interested in and that's why you came here today. And why is that important? Because China will play a bigger role in North Korea's future now Kim Jong-il's death. Why? Because if you look at this statistic, you know, there are very different, many different statistics, you know, the numbers change. But this is, the, you know, some of the latest figures that I got. Up to 90% of North Korea's energy supply comes from China. 80% of North Korea's consumer goods comes from China. 40 to 45% of North Korean food supply comes from China. So that means that without China, North Korea is doomed. And also, as you know better than me, that China shares six body talks and US State Department, you know, all the mantra was that China is the key to the North Korean belligerence. China is the key. And I recently read uh, Victor Charles article yeah, after Kim Jong Il's death that China is the only country that has eyes inside North Korea. China is the only country that has eyes inside North Korea. I'm sure there are some other countries who have, you know, ears inside China who have noses inside North Korea as well. So it's China is not the only country, I think. And President Lee Myung Bak unsuccessfully tried to communicate with uh, Hu Jintao uh, after Kim Jong Il's death. You know, it was a big news in South Korea, and I heard why Hu Jintao declined to maybe, you know received a phone call from uh, Lee Myung-bak as well from my Chinese colleagues. That's something that we can talk about later. And 
Kim Jong Un's North Korea has a lot of uh, uncertainty. You know, his <laughs> lack of uh, his lack of inexperience, experience, and charisma increase uncertainty. And China is the only country. Many media reports, including me, you know, we habitually say, you know, North Korea and China they are allies, blood ties, you know, from the Korean War. So. Where North Korea turned to in times of needs, a friend in need is a friend indeed. So North Korea is in a situation of need, and North Korea will turn to China more at this time. And China, in China's influence in North Korea will naturally increase. So China is a key player in North Korea, and Chinese views count. So let's ask the Chinese. Okay. So how the survey was done? Um, a total of 46 Chinese experts on Korea was surveyed, and these are the people that whose names you see on my writing articles. Okay, these are the people from Peking University, um, Chinese Communist Party School, Tsinghua University, Renmin University, uh, Chinese think tanks, former government officials uh, who you meet during your uh, seminars and conferences. And these are typical profile of them. They are male, 75% of them are male in their 30s and 40s. And those people who are over the age of 50, they took about 20%. And 20% of them visited North Korea, right? Yeah. And I think it, this percent, I think we cannot discount because if you compare that figure from South Korea or United States, I think the figure should be much lower. And one thing that different from Chinese scholars is that uh, because of the special relations between China and North Korea, they repeatedly visit uh, North Korea once they start. Uh, a scholar that I know, he regularly visits North Korea about three times a year, right? So they, it's easier for them to visit and they make kind of regular thing. So these are the questions that, I, I, let me just go straight to the questions. These are relevant to the death of Kim Jong-il and prior to that, there have been many reports about media reports about <coughs> imminent collapse of North Korea. I wrote these articles as well. I feel guilty. Uh, so I asked them, these are Chinese perspective, not my perspective. Uh, I asked each questions to different scholars and how about like I ask this question to all these people and round up and do some statistics, right? So see how the overall views are about the same or differ. And do you think it North Korea will collapse, do you agree? And the close 50%, hard to say, uncertain, right? Relatively unlikely, it won't happen. Won't happen is close to 25%, right? And, you know, agree part is very low. So Chinese scholars, Chinese experts on North Korea, they believe or they want to believe that North Korea is not likely to meet imminent collapse, or they're going to not let it happen, I guess. There are some intentions also, wishful thinking plus intentions, right? And plus their national interest, okay? How likely do you think North Korea will give up nuclear weapons? These are one of the key questions, right? <coughs> because China is chair of the Six Party Talks, and the goal of the Six Party Talks is to persuade North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons. And what if North Korea does not give up nuclear weapons, right? So, do you think North Korea will give up nuclear weapons? Unlikely, right? It's getting close to 60%. Right? Perhaps, hard to say, none. You know, 
those people is the 8% actually. Those people who believe that there is no chance whatsoever that North Korea will give up nuclear weapons, they are also close to 10%, right? So if you total that, it's you know, more than 60% of Chinese experts in North Korea, a country that is supposed to know the most about North Korea, they believe that there is very little chance North Korea will give up nuclear weapons. Interesting. Don't you think so? Interesting. And we just talked about six-party talks, right? Six-party talks. And there has been a lot of debate about the effectiveness of six-party talks. I asked this question to late president, you know, South Korean president Kim Dae-jung when he visited Beijing in 2009, prior to his death. And Kim Dae-jung was a strong supporter of six-party talks. Um, because there was no other better alternative, a comment, a view that which will come out later. So I asked this question, six party talks <coughs> is effective in resolving Pyongyang's nuclear drive. And the majority of the, the largest viewpoint is that because there is no better alternative, we still have to rely on six party talks, right? These are. But more interestingly, how much percent? You know, close to 30% think that six party talks is de facto that. Yeah, it's in de facto that. <coughs> China is a uh, host of the six party talks, but Chinese experts of the uh, Korean Peninsula, they believe that six party talks is that, right? This is interesting. If six-party talks is not functional, it's not working, when what is the reason behind it, right? And what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the six-party talks? And ba -bam -bam, look at it here. Lack of trust between North Korea and the United States. You know, it's the largest portion. And this reveals a, a frame of thinking how China sees the nuclear game and where it is not working. Basically, they see it as a game between Pyongyang and Washington. Although the Western media outlets, including myself, we often habitually portray that, you know, China is not making its due effort. China is not responsible. China is not, you know, responsible behaving, you know. So it's six party talks is not working not pressuring North Korea enough, but China thinks that, you know, the problem lies in between North Korea and the United States. And then lack of trust between US and China. Very interesting. So then there are six countries playing their games in security talks, each with different national interest. Some are allies, some are friends, some are enemies, some are competitors. There are different national interests competing each other. Sometimes they cooperate each other. But there must be a country that has the largest leverage, according to Chinese perspective, in resolving and getting the six-party talks going. And I ask this question, who is the who holds the largest leverage in resolving North Korea's nuclear drive. You know, we might think that the China is the answer, but Chinese think that United States has the largest leverage in making the six-party talks working. And then China is the second, right? This is interesting. This is a question that over the years, whenever Ch South Korean experts, whenever South Korean scholars, when they visit Beijing, they always ask this question to the Chinese side. Do you support unification of the two Koreas? I think this is one of the stupidest questions they can pose. Because when there is a microphone going, and when there are audiences, when there are reporters, you know, there is a set rule, you know, there's a script that you know, Chinese say, oh, 
we support a peaceful <laughs> reunification of the two Koreas. I mean, it's the you know script the answer, but you know Koreans are Koreans. You know, unification is you know our 우리의 소원은 통일. Our wish is unification, as we you know from when you was young. We learn to sing this song, right? So this is our national wish, unification. And China is a very important China is an important stakeholder. So we ask this question out of impulse. Do you support unification of the two Koreas? And but when they know you and when they know you enough that you know they are not willing to cheat you. And when they're willing to reveal some personal side, personal views about what they truly believe about, uh, you know, whether they're willing to support the unification of the two Koreas, this is probably close to the answer, I think. I'm not sure, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I think this is some worrisome. You know, close to 30 percent, right? one third of Chinese scholars, they think that. I don't support unification of the two Koreas. Okay? This is very worrisome. So over half of them are ambivalent, whether I should support or not. And 30% of them are, they know they are not going to support unification of the two Koreas. Why? Let's see why. I'm a good journalist, so I ask this question to them as well. Why? Why you don't? And this gives some hint why they might be reluctant to support unification of two Koreas. Here, the big ones here. Because unified Korea might pose a security threat to China. They see Korea, unified Korea, as a threat, a potential threat. I think this might strike you some people, unified Korea, small country, how could it become a threat? But China believes so. Does it make sense? It makes sense to me. Because from Chinese perspective, you know, South Korean population is about 50 million, North Korean, 23 million, sum it up together, around 80 million, after unification, the population will grow about 100 million, right? Then that will become a powerful. And also, Chinese people are worried about a very nationalistic Korea, unified, strong. And they fear that a strong nationalistic Korea may launch a territorial claim over historical disputed Manchuria, which South Koreans call it Gando, right? Yeah. And these are, from our perspective, kind of a very, you know, it's kind of like strange, but these are the feelings coming from Chinese. And I've heard this many, 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 many times. And I think the problem is that South Korean scholars, Chinese Korean government officials, they kind of tend to underestimate these concerns. When you ask a question to Chinese, do you support unification of the two Koreas? They'll always answer, yes, I support the unification of two Koreas. So a good question is that, under what circumstances do you support the unification of two Koreas? You, know, you learn over the years how to communicate with the Chinese. Okay? So when you ask more detailed <coughs> questions, they can answer you a more detailed, more nuanced answer. Okay? So if you conditionally support Korean unification, what is that condition? And these are very interesting. But most interesting thing is that Unified Korea should become pro-China takes only 5%. Unification by South Korean initiative, but being neutral between America and 
China, 43%. Okay? So they want unified Korea being neutral between Washington and Beijing. And there are also American troops here. Let's look at this one first. Unification by South Korean initiative, but without U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula, 26%. So we want support unification of Korea, but there should be no American troops on the Korean Peninsula. Why? You know the answer. Unified Korea, American troops close the Yalu River facing the Chinese you know, folks right across the river. China sees that as a potential threat as well. Or unification of South, two Koreas under South Korean initiative, but if American troops stay below the 38th parallel, that I can take it, 9%. Okay? So we can see that Chinese psychology of unification of Korea is not a matter of Korea. Their concern is not about Korea, but it's about United States. And this has been very, very consistent. When Chinese scholars, when Chinese experts, when Chinese government officials talk about Korea, you have to look at, you know, when they talk about Korea, their eyes are not on Korean Peninsula, but their eyes are in Washington. This is very consistent, very consistent. And basically they think that North Korean nuclear issue is a game between Washington and Beijing. Seoul is not a factor here. Come on. Okay. Great. Do you think American government is willing to sign a peace treaty with North Korea to resolve Pyongyang's nuke issue permanently? I think many people here, they know why this question is relevant, because peace treaty is a condition to permanently end the Korean War, right? And when they sign a peace treaty, then they will normalize diplomatic relations. That means that there will be American embassy in Pyongyang, right? But Chinese think that U.S. will be unwilling to go in that direction. Why? Because it goes against U.S. security interest in East Asia. So if you look at it, 63% on the current East Asian security situation, no. What that means is that the situation that China and U.S. compete for leadership in East Asia U.S. is coming back, returning to East Asia. China is flexing its muscle, right? And North Korea provides a rational, a manageable threat that can provide the national to the Washington to deploy and have U.S. troops stationed in East Asia. And that is to contain China. And that's how Chinese psychology works here. Well, if Pyongyang complies with the Ukrainian obligation, yes, 17%. But this uh, again shows that Chinese concern is on Korean Peninsula is about America. And this is a very interesting, very interesting, very interesting uh, result. Do you believe, how do you define the current relationship between China and North Korea? In many journalistic writing, the relationship between North Korea and China always kind of allies, blood ties. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong's, Mao Zedong's son died in, during the Korean War. His tomb is in, in North Korea. China sent one million troops to North Korea during the Korean War. Among them, about 
370,000 Chinese soldiers either died or severely injured. And so there are some emotional values and that kind of started, you know, those ally, emotional bonding, you know, China, North Korea friendly ties, right? But when you ask them upfront and personally, hey, what, what's the nature of you guys' relationship with those North Koreans, man? Tell me about it. Okay? When you ask them in a very up close and personal manner, and look at here, 47 percent, those who read Chinese, Ban Xin Ban the Peng Yo, it's a half trusting, half suspicious friend. This is the almost half of the relationship. And I didn't choose this Chinese. By the way, all this survey was initially done in Chinese, and then I translated back into English. I chose this particular expression because a, there is a professor at Peking University School of International Relations. I was sitting in his class and during his lecture to the Chinese students, he actually used this expression, you know, and then Chinese students, they laughed, they giggled. That means that, you know, they think that, you know, this expression is very interesting and also they agree with this expression, you know. So I used, borrowed that expression and you, you included it in the survey, exactly using the same expression. And also, about quarter of the Chinese experts in Korea think that the two countries are strategically comparable to each other. So they need each other out of their common strategy against United States. Very interestingly, even though media outlets habitually characterize them as friends, and they are maintaining a friendly ties in the official media reports, like Xinhua News Agency, but only 4% think that they are actually friends. Okay? Allies, only 13%, 13%. These are very interesting. I just to explain to you, Ban Xin Ban is the half trusting and half associated friend. So that was the expression that I just used. So I'll just sum it up what I just talked. North Korea's chance for collapse, only 14% of Chinese scholars think that North Korea has a chance for collapse. 14, so one out of 10, you know, North Korea, very low, right? And 65% of Chinese scholars think that North Korea won, won give up nuclear weapons. And Chinese experts are ambivalent, undecided about unification, 54%. Or they oppose Korean unification, over 30%. And half of Chinese scholars think that Unification of the two Koreas by South Korean initiative is a threat, po pose a potential threat to China, 50%. I think this is something that those folks in Seoul, they need to pay attention to. And if Korean Peninsula is unified again, the unified Korea should be neutral between Washington and Beijing. So this is one of the conditions. In terms of six-body talks or North Korean nuclear issue, international media outlets always point out China as primarily responsible, not exercising its influence. But Chinese scholars think that U.S. is the key. U.S. is the key here. And only one out of 10 Chinese experts believe that China North Korea relations are allies. And about 50% of them think that the two countries are strategically need each other. And there is no 
there is a low chance for peace treaty between Pyongyang and Washington. And in terms of six party talks, if you remember, about a quarter of them believe that six party talks is uh, dead, is a uh, you know, failure. But as long as there is no better alternative, you know, we should stick to the six party talks. And the biggest obstacle between in six party talks is a uh, lack of trust between Washington and Beijing, followed by lack of trust between Washington and Pyongyang. And this is not part of the paper that you have, but I'm, I think there are some South Korean journalists here. So I just added one more survey. There are some other uh, data, but given the time constraint, I have not included. But if you pay me, I'll share that data. <laughs> you know, there is no free lunch. There is a free lunch here, KEI, but when it comes to me, you know, deal, you know, we need a deal, right? You know, when North Korea wants to give us nuclear weapons, you have to give them economic aid and, you know, security guarantee as well. When you want a data, you know, there is no free lunch, right? You know, KEI is an exception here, right? So it's very interesting. I asked, you know, I asked a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, questions related to journalism reporting because this is part of my dissertation. And a bulk of our understanding of North Korea comes from South Korean media. Do you think South Korean media reports on North Korea are objective? You know, there is a very objective. Those responses are non-existence because. <laughs> It's a zero percent, zero percent. You know, sometimes uh, okay, sometimes not. You know, really sure. It's about you know sixty percent. You know. What I'm trying to say is that you know I added this question because over the last ten years, I heard this. You know, they mentioned this question over and over again. You know, they cannot trust. South Korean media, even though South Korean media provides, produces the bulk of news reports on North Korea, but hey, you know, I cannot trust those South Korean journalists, including Sonny, right? Yeah. There's something is fish, right? Because, you know, many of them believe that, you know, South Korean media are politically, you know, motivated, or their sources are from the government because very few journalists have direct access inside North Korea. So they have to get the information about North Korea from the South Korean government. And when the South Korean government is hardline against North Korea, then the information that South Korean government provides to South Korean journalists, you know, tips are sometimes you know, disinformation, right? Trying to influence the dynamics in the regional security. So they don't trust. Interestingly, many American journalists also personally, privately express these views as well. So this is the conclusion. Um, you know, even Chinese experts, those folks in the world who are supposed to know the most about North Korea, even the Chinese experts believe that North Korea is unlikely to give up nuclear weapons. <laughs> and what complicates the situation is that you know, there are a lot of leadership exchanges in 2012, United States, South Korea, China, I don't know, possibly Japan, and also Russia. And Japan changes all the time, right? So, and this might complicate the situation, right? uncertainties. These are threats on the situation of North Korea. And but there are not that helpful circumstances as well. That is that China is very much concerned about Seoul-Washington military alliance and lack of a trust between Washington and Beijing, Washington and Pyongyang, between the two Koreas and between Beijing and Seoul as well. And also, China, 
Chinese people are very much concerned about South Korea's emerging nationalism and how that will affect the unification of the two Koreas and eventually how you know, that will emerge as a territorial claim over what South Koreans call a lost territory, you know, the Manchuria, right? So these are kind of a concerns from Chinese and that will kind of a, you know, prevent or they kind of work as an unwillingness on the part of China to support the unification of two Koreas. But then, you know, there are some opportunities, right? Only 5% of Chinese scholars, they answer that, you know, unified Korea must be pro-China. You know, they think that as long as, majority of them said, as long as unified Korea maintains neutrality between Washington and, and Beijing, I'm willing to support unification of two Koreas. You know, contrary to the common beliefs, you know, our relationship with North Koreans, we are not really allies. You know, we are not really allies. Okay? Although we give that appearance once in a while, but like, you know, after the you know, death of Kim Jong-il, uh, China showed a really friendly posture to the world. You know, we have close friends of uh, North Korea, but this is a calculative, you know, move not a what they are really thinking inside. And China, North Korea, you know, we are not really friends and allies either. We just need each other out of our common strategy in East Asia, coping strategy to deal with uh, you know, US troops, South Korea. So it's like you know, a Chinese scholar you know, mentioned in English that you know, we, our relationship is sleeping with the enemies. Right, you know, it's direct quote. And there are, should be some improvements made. Obviously, among the six different stakeholders, there should be a lot of communications, a lot of communications, trust building. And South Korean President Lee Myung-bak tried to call Hu Jintao, but Hu Jintao, you know, reacted to Kong call. High-level crisis management channel should be established, right? Otherwise, you know, there's and there should be also an effort to allay you know, all sorts of uh, Chinese concerns that have been mentioned. That have been quite uh, you know, downplayed by you know, other stakeholders. Plus, you know, this is one thing interesting. Um, you know, prior to the, you know, 2009 you know, second nuclear testing, China was more of, you know, going together with Washington in pressuring, although different degrees, pressuring North Korea. But then China realized that, you know, we cooperate with United States, but we are not getting anything as a reward, right? That was one uh, complaint. We cooperate, we work with the United States to pressure North Korea but U.S. is not giving us any kickback reward. That's one concern. Second concern was that the more we pressure North Korea, the far away North Korea drifts from our sphere of influence. You know, we pressure North Korea. U.S. is not giving us a kickback. U.S. is not rewarding us. Worse, our influence on North Korea is drifting away. So that was a two of the concerns that Chinese scholars uh, have shared with me in many different occasions. And as we know, and also written in the paper, that there was an uh, adjustment uh, during the summer of uh, 2009. Uh, Hu Jintao and the top leaders, they met and had a very fierce and open discussion whether we stick to North Korea or we should renounce North Korea. But then they decided to stick with North Korea. And October of 2009, you know, China dispatched you know, Wen Zhabao, Premier Wen Zhabao to North Korea, uh, consolidating, strengthening, and showing that you know, we are not going to you know, let you go. You know, we are going to stick with you. Okay? We are friends, I think. And I think what we see since 2009 is a continuation of that China-North Korea 
bonding together. Uh, but then, as I mentioned in my paper, the relationship between China and North Korea are very fluid. There are rooms for change, and the details are, I think, elaborated in my paper. So I'll stop here. And oh, by the way, uh, I think the, one of the questions that you know, a serious scholar might you know, pose is that, so Sonny, how much do you believe all these results, right? How much do you believe, you know? Well, there was a previous uh, survey, not exactly the same survey, but it was uh, one of South Korean lawmaker. I think his name is Ku Sang Chan from Grand National Party. He came, he did a survey with uh, 1,500 Chinese people and asked Chinese people who are the most friendly countries, who are the countries that you most favor. And the results was that number one, Russia, number two, South Korea, number three, North Korea. That was a really strange result. And the Chinese people, you know, vigorously protested. Something is quite not right here in this result. How could we, Russia is number one, you know, we, we don't like Russia. Hey. South Korea cannot never become number two either. You know, something is very strange in this survey. And North Korea number three? Hey, come on, wake up. So I think, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to have a very accurate ballpark, you know, estimate. You know, the more number of surveys with the more number of people are done does not necessarily reflect the mainstream views. But then I think uh, developing trust and personal bonding, uh, I think that is really, you know, helps. And I think these are it's the answers that I got here. There is another, you know, survey that I did with Chinese journalists. Uh, more than you know, 100 Chinese journalists. That result is about the same with this one, and that these two results are about the same. You know what I have been getting feedback from Chinese scholars over the years. So I know this is pretty much representative. You know, you know, even though you have some doubts about it, but we can discuss about it. So okay, that's about it. If you have any questions.